Well, hey, all jokes aside, in fact, it reminds me, I did come across a story of, of the famous uh, coach of Ohio State, Woody Hayes, and uh, one of my favorite stories about him relates to the fact that he had a player on his team, and as we all know, many of these athletic guys aren't the smartest in, in, the, in the academic world, and so he had, one, he, had a, he had a player who was failing his grades academically, and he couldn't afford to lose him on the team, and so he went to a particular professor he was struggling with and said, look, you got to pass this guy. I, I can't afford to lose him. And the professor thought for a while. He said, okay, Woody, I'll work with you. He said, you know, bring him in. I'm going to ask him a very simple question on physiology. He says, if he, if he can answer it, we'll, we'll move on to the next semester. So he brings his player in. This is a, supposedly a true story. The player comes in, and the professor says, look, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. He said, if you can answer it, I'm going to give you a passing grade. He said, name three vital organs in your body. The prayer looks at him, he said, the mind, the heart, and the bowels, of which there are five, A, E, I, O, and U. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> some guys need help, right? And, and uh, if the truth is told, we all, we all need help. And as I was thinking about what I'm going to say this morning, um, I thought we'd just come back to look at the whole essence and uh, uh, reason for men's ministry. I want to speak on the subject this morning, let's talk man to man. I want to talk about the the need for and the nature of complementary male friendship. And, And I think one of the best ways to get our hands around that is to take a look at the relationship between David and Jonathan. And for a few moments we're going to do that and we're going to see them talk man to man to connect at a, at a level that you and I need to strive for. And, and just on a side, if you wanted a, some reading homework, uh, read a book called Quality Friendship by Gary Enrig. Uh, he used to be in Canada. He's a Dallas grad, but he actually is the pastor, at least the last time I looked, of uh, the EV Free Church in Redlands here in California, Dr. Gary Enrig. Uh, Moody Press produces this book. It's called Quality Friendship. It looks at the whole issue of friendship. But this guy does a phenomenal job at expositing uh, passages in First and Second Samuel on the relationship between David and Jonathan. If you're leading a men's group, um, this would be a great book for the study around uh, coffee on a week morning or whatever. Quality friendship. But I want to base my remarks on a, on a verse that I find rather striking. Take your Bible, turn to Second Samuel chapter 1. Second Samuel chapter 1. And we're going to break into David's kind of lament over Jonathan's death. We're at that point in uh, the biblical narrative where, where Jonathan has died in battle along with his father Saul. David is, is taken up with both remembrance and remorse as he reflects on his relationship with Jonathan. And here we have his kind of his eulogy, his lament, his reflection. And break in at verse 25. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Now listen to these words, because did, did they not catch you off guard? You have been very pleasant to me. This is on one man talking about another man. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perish. Well, I want to use that verse and, and talk to you about um, complementary male friendship and, and fellowship. Let me begin by illustrating what we're kind of considering this morning. Jackie Robinson was the first African American to play in the major leagues of uh, baseball here in the United States. And because he was the first day, he had to work his way through the whole racial barriers that were still very much part of society back then. And because of that, wherever he was, playing from the Brook for the Brooklyn Dodgers, he would face fastballs to the head. Uh, he would be spiked on the bases. The crowds would hurl brutal epithets at him. And, and that was difficult and hard. And it, it seemed to come to a, a crescendo and a, a crest one particular day when the Brooklyn Dodgers were playing in Boston. 
And Jackie Robinson had faced the fastballs, the spikes, the, the badgering of the crowd, and he stood alone on second base. And the crowd was hurling its insults at him. And, and he stood there alone, dejected, discouraged. And according to the story I read, out of the dugout of the Dodgers comes a white southerner gentleman by the name of Pee Wee Rees. And he goes over in front of the Boston crowd and he puts his arm around Jackie Robinson. He just stands there. The quiet, the, 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 the crowd begins to quiet and, and I think people realize this is a significant moment. This is one man reaching out to another man at a point of need and stress. And according to Jackie Robinson, that moment saved his baseball career. And eventually he, he uh, overcame the obstacles and the hurdles that were sent in front of him. And it seems to me, guys, this morning that that story is the story of us. You and I as men have a pressing need to find other men to walk with and talk with. Men we can tap for wisdom and men we can source for encouragement. Men whose footsteps provide us a road map to biblical manhood, fatherhood, and sainthood. Because the reality is, I find this both personally and pastorally, that most men in our churches are running a deficit in friendship. They stand alone. They have no one they truly pray with or share with, outside perhaps of their wife. But there's certainly nothing that that comes close or approximates to to complementary Christian meal friendship. One study I read about says that um, there's only uh, 10% of men that have, have any kind of real friendships with other men. And, um, and, and generally speaking, the friendships that men share come, rarely come close to the intimacy and the transparency that women know in their friendships. And so, for a few moments this morning, I want to talk to you about the need for complementary male friendship and the nature of complimentary male friendship. Let's just talk about the need for it. Let me just reinforce that, that you being here is the best use of your Saturday morning. That this men's group, this, this, this body of believers at Kindred is a significant part of our church and, and can become a driving force for God's glory. You and I need each other. We need Times like this, we need small groups, we need to hang out together, we need to shoot the breeze together, we need to re- read the Word of God together, pray together, look out for one another. There's an absolute need for it. You say, why, Pastor? Well, number one, the natural need for friendship and fraternity. God has placed it in our DNA that you and I need to look to and lean on other people. The Bible knows nothing about the moral Marlboro man. The kind of Rambo mentality that, you know, I can do it myself. In fact, if you go back to Genesis 2, verse 18, what does God say as he looks at Adam on the sixth day? It is not good that man should be alone. Now, God's provision was a counterpart of another sex. But you certainly wouldn't want to read into that, that man finds his total... um, uh, need exhausted in female friendship within marriage. I mean, that verse is a reminder simply that you and I weren't born for individualism or to live apart from other people. It is not good that man should be alone. In fact, it's interesting if you read that first week in creation, you read it like this, and God made, you know, the heavens and the earth, and he, he made the the light to shine by day and the stars to shine by night, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And again and again, God looks upon what he's doing and says, it's good. I like this. And all of a sudden, we're pulled up short. It's not good. There stands this lonely, solitary figure, and God said, it's not good. In fact, the Hebrew would be, could be well translated, this is bad. Something awry here, something incomplete here, something that's still got to happen here. And guys, you and I are are, are made for friendship. Another aspect of of Genesis, which we take literally, is that man, both male and female, were created in God's what? Image. God stamped 
His image upon us. Have you ever thought about this? God exists in society. We believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. That there are three persons existing within one Godhead. Co-essential, co-equal, co-eternal. There's the Father. We just sang about it. There's the Son and there's the Spirit. God exists in plurality. In society. The Father dialogues with the Son. The Spirit communes with the Son. And so when God stamped His image upon us, He stamped upon us the need for society. The need to relate and look to others. And so you and I need to understand that you and I need to create a context and seek out complementary male friendship because that's in our DNA as human beings. John Milton, the Puritan poet, said of Genesis 2, verse 18, Loneliness is the first thing which God's eye named not good. Don't be lonely. Don't kind of struggle by yourself. Seek out an elder. Seek out a, a fellow here in the fellowship that can come alongside you. Why is it important for you and I to emphasize male friendship? Number one, it's a natural need. Number two, we're facing in our day and in our generation the emasculation of the American meal. And we need to meet as men on a regular basis to remind ourselves that God has called us to manhood, to leadership. This is the, this is the unisex androgynous age which seeks to blur out all sexual distinctions. In fact, sadly, I was reading uh, of an article in the Good Housekeeping column. It was called The Way We Are. And the columnist talked about a young boy who was asked by his neighbor what he wanted to be when he grew up. And the boy replied, a female fork lift driver. I mean, we have a governor that just signed a bill here in California saying if a guy thinks he's a girl, he can go into a girl's bathroom in public high schools. This, this is the age. It's sick. It's sad. It's godless. And, and, and this is the time for you and I to be real men who, who exhibit the, the image of God, who, who stand up to our calling to be leaders in our homes and in our communities uh, to, to live out what, what um, God has asked us to be and to be unashamed in our maleness, to train our sons to be men. Don't let your wife wrap them in, in bubble paper. Let them fall out of a tree. Let them play with guns and tanks. They're boys. They're men. Teach them to protect their little sister, to respect their mother, to take leadership in the home. Give them chores to do. Make them earn their pocket money. Because God has called us to be men and train our boys to be men. Because we're facing what Tony Evans at a Promise Keeper's Rally calls the feminization of the American meal. Or he puts it another way, sissified men. Don't be a sissified man. Come here and join with other men and cheerlead each other to be real men of the word. Fathers to your ch- our children and, and lovers to our wives and good neighbors to our, 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 our community. Chuck Swindoll put it, this way, remember when men were men? Remember when you could tell by looking? Remember when men knew who they were, liked how they were, and didn't want to be anything but what they were? Remember when it was the man who boxed and wrestled and bragged about how much they could bench press? Remember it was when it was the women who wore the makeup, the earrings, and the bikinis? <laughs> remember when it was the man who initiated the contact and took the lead in a relationship, made long life commitments, and modeled masculinity grounded in security and stability? That's becoming a shadow on the wall. Men are frightened, intimidated. Don't be that. We need to be men to each others, to each other and to others. Here's a third reason why we need complementary male friendship. Not only because it's, it's in our nature, not only because the world is trying to sissify uh, and silence men, but thirdly because there's been a colossal failure of men. I mean, on the one hand, we, we could talk about the attack that's happening outside what society is doing in terms of redesigning the home and, and uh, uh, 
redesigning uh, malehood and, and womanhood. But the real problem, too, is, is that manhood is being sabotaged from the inside. There's been a failure of men to be fathers and husbands and mentors. Listen to these words um, by uh, David Blankenhorn in his, his book. It's a little uh, old now, but it still speaks to what's going on. It's called Fatherless America. He says this, The United States is becoming an increasingly fatherless society. A generation ago, an American child could reasonably expect to grow up with his or her father. Today, an American child can reasonably expect not to. This astonishing fact is reflected by statistics. Tonight, about 40% of American children will go to sleep in homes in which their fathers do not live. Guys, there's more absentee fathers today than in the Second World War. And then there was a reason, a good reason. Here, it's selfishness, it's cowardice. It's a lack of commitment and character on the part of men. And you and I don't want to add to those statistics. We want to be men of commitment and character who do take on the responsibilities of leading a home and loving our wives and mentoring our children. Living the truth and speaking the truth. Here's a third just reason for the rationale for men's ministry, the need for men to talk man to man. The biblical call to male mentoring and leadership development. You and I are called to spend time with each other, to get into each other's lives. Just a couple of verses will will reinforce that. Tim Paul's a great example. Listen to what he says of Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 verse 2. To Timothy, a true son in the faith. Timothy wasn't his biological son. Paul adopted him, mentored him, discipled him, poured his life into him. And he could call this young man his son in the faith. Are there young men who can say that about you? Are there your sons? Can they say that about you as their dad? Are there grandchildren in your life who can say that about you as a grandfather? You know what? That's my son in the faith. I've mentored him. Poured my life into him, spent time praying, crying, asking God, seeking God's purpose and will to the revelation of his word. What does Paul say to, to Timothy again in, in the Second Timothy 1 verse 2? The same thing to Timothy, my beloved son. In chapter 2 verse 2, he'll go on to say to Timothy, here's what you need to do. You need to do what I did. And you need to get others to do what you and I have been doing. These things you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. I mean, that's a biblical mandate. Not just for pastors, but for men. I try to make sure that at any given time I'm working in men's lives. But that's not just for me to do or the elders to do or some paid staff to do. That's your calling too. Your immediate church is your family. Your wider church is your church. And ask yourself, you know, who am I, you know, impacting for God's glory? The church ought to be a context of incubation for masculinity and male-led ministry. I I like these words from from Howard Hendricks. I think this this is a great quote. Howard Hendricks says that every man needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. I want you to write that down and think about that. Every man needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. He says this, You need an older man to show you the ropes, a friend to hold you accountable, and a younger man who's watching your example. That's great, isn't it? We need a Paul in our lives like Timothy had. And then we need a Barnabas in our lives like Paul had. And then we need it, you know... um, a Timothy in our lives where we're mentoring and, and shaping the next, the next generation. Be challenged by that. Well, I've said all of that to bring us to just consider for a few moments this relationship between um, David and Jonathan. I just want to reinforce there's a need for something like what's going on between David and Jonathan. You and I need to make sure that in any given week, You and I are interacting with men who are calling us to a higher standard of godliness and a greater conformity to Christ. 
Well, let's for a few moments just this morning look um, at, at David and Jonathan. I want to come back to that verse. I mean, here's David. The news has come to him of um, Jonathan's sad and sudden slaying. And he says in verse 16, I'm distressed. And he looks back, turns the pages, rewinds the video. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me, wonderful, surpassing the love of many women. I mean, David's heart is flooded with a wave of emotion and grief. And yet a rising tide of thankfulness for a fantastic friendship. I mean, if we had a testimony time, could, could any of us stand up and talk about that, those kind of fantastic friendships that have changed the course of your life, that you can mark a turning point with God because you met that person? Now, let me get something out of the way before I say three brief things about this relationship. I want to say this because given the, 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 the day that we're in, and the homosexual agenda, even within the church, there's nothing untoward going on here between David and Jonathan. There's nothing homosexual or unpure about this relationship. And I'm sure about that. Number one, because homosexuality is roundly condemned in Scripture. And I don't think we'd find David giving thanks or to God for uh, a relationship that was outside of God's purpose and, and will. Later sins, sadly, will prove that David had a healthy heterosexual appetite. And number three, I think you need to understand these, these words of endearment and intimacy in terms not of sexuality but fidelity. I mean, if anything, if, if anything, this is a sad commentary on the emptiness of polygamy. I mean, David had many women, and yet he didn't have a relationship with any one of them that came close to the fidelity and transparency and, and intimacy he had with Jonathan. I think that's the point he's making here. Old Matthew Henry, the, the commentator, would say, he had reason to say that Jonathan's love to him was wonderful. Surely never was the like for a man to love one whom he knew was to take crown, the crown over his head and to be so faithful to his rival. This far surpassed the highest degree of conjugal affection and constancy. I mean, as David looks back, given what Jonathan lost in his friendship, what Jonathan gave up in his friendship, what Jonathan faced in terms of threats and his father's, his father's disrespect. I mean, that kind of loyalty, that kind of fidelity. John David says, nobody else did that for me. Nobody else came close to being that kind of friend. Sacrificially and, 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 and uh, the like. So, here's three things, and I'm seriously going to be quick about it. I want you to think about what's going on between us as a group and what is still yet to take place. And let's look at three marks of a of complementary male friendship. The first mark between David and Jonathan is I want you to see that this friendship between them was timely. This friendship between them was timely. There's no doubt here as we find ourselves in Second Samuel 1 that David turned the clock back. And he went back to those early days when his future hung in the balance. Let's get, our, let's get our bearings in the text. Fifteen years earlier, Samuel had anointed David as king. David would wait many years before he'd actually be crowned king of Israel in Hebron. But David, it, it had become clear to David and his family that God had marked him out for something special. We're back about 15 years from, um, from this point. And yet, I'm sure as, as the months and years unfolded, given, as we'll see in a moment, Saul's jealousy and hatred and paranoia towards David, that, that promise by Samuel must have seemed like a fairy tale. In fact, if you read the text of 1 Samuel 17 following, you'll find that, that Saul tried to kill David a total of six times. And yet it was during those years, those years of disappointment, those years of desperation, 
that the David was introduced to Jonathan and a friendship blossomed. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18 verses 1 through 4, and, and, and we'll, we'll hear the biblical narrator tell us about this friendship. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that, that day and would not let him go home to his father's house any more. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his belt, uh, bow and his belt. And, and as, you, as you read on from this point forward, um, Saul's jealousy becomes apparent and, and evident. And uh, six times he will, he will try and, and end the life of David. But through it all, Jonathan will act as a shield and a support through thick and thin. David needed such a friendship, and that void was filled by this timely and tender friendship between David and Jonathan. In fact, let me say this, and this is simply the point I want us to reflect on. I think it's inconceivable to envision how David would have survived those years of exile and exasperation without the lifeline of Jonathan's friendship. In a book on the life of David called um, Leap Over the Wall by Eugene Peterson, here's what he says of, of that friendship. Friendship is a much underestimated aspect of spirituality. It's, it's every bit as significant as prayer and fasting. Like the use of water and bread and wine, friendship takes what's common in human experience and turns it into something holy. Friendship with David complicated Jonathan's life enormously. He risked losing his father's favor and willingly sacrificed his own royal future. But Jonathan's friendship was essential to David's life. It's highly unlikely that David could have persisted in serving Saul without the friendship of Jonathan. And then he makes this phenomenal statement. Jonathan's friendship entered David's soul in a way that Saul's hatred never did. That's a beautiful little statement. Jonathan's love entered David's heart in a way that Saul's jealousy never did. He was able to survive because... Jonathan had come into his life and he had held up his drooping arms and, and brought encouragement to his heart and pointed to a better future based upon the promise that God had made through the prophecy of Samuel. The right man showed up at the right time. And Fifteen years later, David takes a moment to remember through lamentation and eulogy what Jonathan had meant to him. Guys, let, let's pray that we become that to each other. That in the providence of God over time here, and, and, and one or two here and three and four there, that all of a sudden God in His goodness and His mercy, as you and I open ourselves up to His leading, that friendships develop among this group of men that are timely. And God sent so that at the right time, the right man will show up in each of our lives. You've, you know what your need is. You know where you're weak. You know where you're, you're, there's a deficit running in your spiritual walk with God or your theological understanding. You know what? There are guys out there that God can send into your life to help you. And you and I should be seeking them. I, I look back. I was converted at the age 16. Uh, joined the, the church that my father was a deacon in. And, and in God's goodness, within about three to four months, a friendship blossomed between me and a guy called David Mears. And I look back on that. It was so timely. Our friendship was real. It was strong. It was, it was, it was uh, manly. It was biblical. And I look back on that and, and, and realize I, I'm, I'm partly who I am and what I am because of that friendship. It was so timely for me as a young Christian to find another young man in the church, just a year or two ahead of me, but many years ahead of me spiritually, who uh, threw his arms around me. And uh, both of us were each other's best man. He's in the ministry in a church in Belfast right up until this moment. I look back too, I was, I was a year uh, from coming out of the Baptist College in Belfast, I, I needed to be mentored and, 
and uh, shown the ropes as a young pastor. And I was assigned uh, uh, an internship at Milltown Baptist Church with Pastor Frederick McLaughlin, who sent greetings on Sunday night if you were here. Our friendship is decades old. And it's a real friendship. There's hardly a week or two weeks go by, but he doesn't call or I don't call him. And we talk about what's going on in each other's ministries and each other's hearts and each other's families. His son was here on Sunday night. And other generations coming up behind us. He's at Master's Seminary. Wonderful young man who, who had a sporting career ahead of him as a rugby player in Ireland, but give it all up because he wants to be a minister of the gospel. I look back and I see in my life, you know, these timely friendships that are precious to me. And, and I trust that that's going on in your life. And, and if it's not, make that a real focus of prayer. And then talk to David or myself or Cliff or Ken or some of them and say, here's my need, and I need a man in my life right now over this issue. The second thing I want you to see, the first point self explanatory but nevertheless good. He looks back 15 years of craziness and madness and meanness and hate, and yet there in the midst of it, God pushed into David's face Jonathan. And the first time they met, their hearts were knit together, and Jonathan loved David. And that was so timely. Secondly, this friendship was enriching. The mark of this friendship was sacrificial love. That's the point, remember, what we noted here? How can David say that Jonathan's love was was surpassing the love of many women. Because if you really guys take a study, and I encourage you to do it, and NREG will help you. If you look at the friendship between David and Jonathan, it's a marvelous one. I'm just going to highlight something that to me is very striking about the fact that this friendship is not only timely, but enriching. Because when Jonathan set his heart on loving David, when Jonathan took David into that that wonderful circle we call friendship, He didn't have an ulterior motive. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about what David was going to do with Jonathan. It was all about what Jonathan could do for David. It was sacrificial. It was enriching. It was about giving his best to the other person and bringing out the best in the other person. Because you see, the bottom line of friendship is this. A good friend will leave you a better friend of God. I mean, that's just the bottom line of biblical friendship. A good friend will leave you a better friend of God. And, and Jonathan uh, enriches David. He had a desire to, to enhance David, and, and he did it by divesting himself and investing himself in David. Take your Bible. Go back to that verse, 1 Samuel 18. We're trying to shed a light on David's comments over in 2 Samuel 1. Look at verse 4, 1 Samuel 18. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword, his bow, and his belt. I mean, these, these are, the, these are the, the insignias of power. Who was next in line for the throne? Jonathan. And yet, over... On the side of the world stage, God had come to a little city called, a little town called Bethlehem, had anointed the, the, the smallest of Jesse's sons and said, no, this is the next king in Israel. I'm done with Saul. I'm, 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 I'm searching for a man after my own heart and I think I've found it. And according to Psalm 78, God took David from out of the sheep fold, made him a leader in Israel, and he led Israel with integrity of heart and skill from those of hands. But Saul doesn't see that. But I think Jonathan gets a whiff of that. The the text doesn't tell us, but I think Jonathan gets a sense, you know what, David, God's got something special for you. God has marked you out. In fact, I'll prove it to you. uh, Go over to uh, 1 Samuel 23. We're at one of those... We're at one of those um, episodes when David's on the run. He's he's hiding. Saul's hounding him. Um, and, And he's in the wilderness of Ziph. And he's dodging. Uh, Saul and his men, uh, Jonathan and, and David rendezvous. And we read here in verse 15, So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. First Samuel 23:15. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God, encouraged him, enriched him spiritually. That's what we're saying. A good friend will leave you a better friend of God. 
Listen to verse 6, 17. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. By now Saul's getting a sense that God's done with him. That feeds into his paranoia, his jealousy. But I think those are striking words, Andy. Here's a young man who actually steps aside and says, David, you come to the fore. I may have dreamt as a boy to be the next king of Israel. My father, you know, had promised that to me. I was educated to that end. I was groomed for that purpose. But you know what? God's got a bigger plan. And it's all about God's will. And it's all about God's agenda. And you know what, David? You're his man. And I'm just going to be next to you. I'm just going to support you. I'm going to enrich you. And, and he crowned, and then literally he crowns David as king. He takes off his belt, his sword. He puts it on David and says, you know what? You're going, to be, you're going to be the next king. And guys, the, you know, the bottom line is that Jonathan didn't approach this relationship with the perspective of what can I get from David, but what can I do for David? I want you to look around just for a moment at the table, the man that's next to you, behind you, and ask yourself, is that, is that what brings us here? And is that what that defines us as a group of men? We're here not for ourselves. We're here for the other men in this room. We have a passion for their marriages, for their kids, for their walk with God. And we're going to divest ourselves. We're going to make whatever sacrifices are needed to be at that Bible study, to encourage those guys or to take leadership because there's a vacuum here or there so that we can minister as men to men for the glory of God. This is, this is true biblical friendship. Look at, look at Saul. It's all about preservation. It's all about eliminating the competition. Look at his son. Hey, I'll give up whatever dreams I had, whatever desires I had for the throne, because David, I want to see God's will for your life get to the next level. And I believe God's given me a role to, to, to make that happen. That, that, that's um, challenging. Um, again, back to Eugene Peterson. Each of us has contact with hundreds hundreds of people who never look beyond the surface appearance. We have dealings with hundreds of people who, who the moment they set their eyes on us, begin calculating what use we can, they can make of us, what they can get of us. We meet hundreds of people who take one look at us, make a snap judgment, and then slot us into a category, so that they. They won't deal with us as persons. They treat us as something less than we are. And if we're a constant association with them, we become less. And then someone enters our life who isn't looking for someone to use, is leisurely enough to find out what's really going on in our life, is secure enough to not to exploit our weakness or attack our strengths, secure, recognizes our inner life, and then understands the difficulty of living out our inner convictions, confirms what's deepest within us, a friend. Guys, that we, there's a friendship deficit. We, we really have more associations than we have friendships. We have more acquaintances than we have friendship. Biblical friendship is timely, providential, God-planned, per- uh, God to the end that you and I might enrich each other by, by, by spending time and transparency and prayer and intimacy with one another, encouraging each other in the Lord. That's going to take time. It's going to take sacrifice. And yet that's what, what God um, calls us to do. I mean, it, for us as believers, it's all modeled by Christ, isn't it? Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, who although equal with God, thought it not robbery. Uh, to be equal with God, and yet he humbled himself, made himself of no reputation. It's what theologians call the kenosis, the self-emptying of Christ. It's not that he ceased to be what he always was. It's not that he ceased to be God. It's that he made, he willingly set aside the independent use of his divine attributes and acted independence to the Father and emptied himself of that, that privilege, that position, and was found 
in the likeness of man, in the form of a servant, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, so that you and I could be enriched. According to Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. That's what Saul, the, the, Jonathan's doing here in a small way. Look at him. He takes off his, his, his royal tunic, his belt, his insignia, his sword, his shield, and he gives it to David. Guys, in an even greater fashion, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal word, the one who basked in the Father's glory and shared an intimacy in the Father's bosom was adored by the angels. He willingly set aside the independent use of his divine prerogatives, he veiled his glory, and he came to enrich us. And if we're his, and we're followers of his, then you and I need to take off, set aside whatever is getting in the way of serving one another, and making this man's ministry what it needs to be. Something that's dynamic and ongoing in each of our lives. Because you and I need to be men of God, And our wives will be thankful for this man's ministry. And our children will praise God for this man's ministry. And Orange County will feel the impact of this man's ministry. Let's talk man to man. Let me give you an illustration. I remember reading the story of of a PhD student who wanted to kind of do a study of the, the Navajo people, and uh, to do that, he went on site, got onto the reservation, started looking at both the character of the people and the customs of the tribe, and, and uh, when he got there, he knew very little uh, Navajo, and there was an old woman he immediately connected with, and a friendship blossomed, and in those early few days and weeks, it was difficult to communicate. She knew very little English. He knew very little Navajo. But after time, a little bit of broken Navajo helped him, and a little bit of broken English helped her. And the time came when he had done his research. He was ready to go back and write his paper. And as he was leaving, the old woman came up to him. And, and in broken English, she cupped her hands around his cheeks. And then she said this, I like me best when I'm with you. It's a great little story. It's a great little line. I mean, there should be some man in our life that we can truly say, you know, I like, I like me best when I'm with you because you challenge me to be different. You hold me accountable to the Word of God. You ask me, am I in the Word? Am I praying? Am I faithful to local church? Am I giving? Am I setting my life in a biblical direction? And I like me best when I'm with you because you're, you're enriching me. That's what biblical male friendship's all about. Guys, the last thought. This friendship was timely. This friendship was enriching. And this friendship was covenantal. What, what would bring David to look back and say, you know what? Man, I'm going to miss Jonathan. I'm going to miss him terribly because even though I'm still surrounded by people that love me, and I've got many wives, he said, you know what? I look back and I, I, I've, I've taken a measurement of that relationship and my goodness, the love and the loyalty. There was something unique and surpassing about it. And I think one of the features of that was that it was covenantal. David turned the pages of this story of loyalty and faithfulness and, and he remembered that he had a true friend and a lifelong buddy. Let's go back to the two, uh, or at least one of the verses we looked at. First Samuel 18, verse 3. Then Jonathan and David, listen, made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. This is, this is friendship based on covenant. These guys made a pledge. They made promises to each other. You, you read about it again in First Samuel 20, verse 24. Or, sorry, 42. Then Jonathan, and then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, May the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. This, this wasn't a friendship based on convenience. This wasn't a friendship based on, on social convention. This was a friendship based on chesed, uh, loyal love. This is the kind of love God had shown towards Israel. If you read the Old Testament, it's all about covenants. The covenants that God made with Israel. And the people of God in the Old Testament were covenant people. Marriage was a covenant. 
God's relationship between Israel and, the, and, and his people were, was a covenant. And here we have David exemplifying that. He said, David, this is, this is chesed love. This is, not, uh, this is not, not about fair weather friendship. You know, this is about through thick and thin. Come high water, come hail, we're going to hang, we're going to hang in there together and, and make it through together. In fact, we don't have time to turn to it, but, but here in, in uh, 1 Samuel 20, verse 42, they, they agree not only to be friends to each other, but to be friends to their children and the descendants. And read the story of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son who was dropped as a kid and hobbled. He was a cripple. He was lame. And when the whole house of Saul is wiped out, Mephibosheth is brought to David's table. And it says in Second Samuel 19, or 9 that David showed kindness to Mephibosheth on Jonathan's account. Why did he love Mephibosheth? Because he loved Jonathan. And this was a generational love. This wasn't convenient. It wasn't for the moment. It was timely. It was enriching. And it was covenantal. Guys, may God enable us to, to have friendships that are not disposable. You know, Americans and American society is a very transitory society. We change our friends like we change our cars every three or four years. That's not friendship. That's just an acquaintance. It's, like, it's, it's something other than what we're talking about. This is a friendship that's lifelong. That uh, can work its way past differences, failures, hard times. It's, it's, this is a friendship for the long haul. And, and you can only have a couple of men in your life that really can never measure up to this. But find them. You only need one or two. You don't need a whole bunch of friends. Just one or two. One or two men whose friendship is timely and enriching and lifelong and loyal and covenantal. Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 says what? A friend loves at all times and a brother is born unto adversity. That's a tremendous challenge. Jonathan lived out his covenant friendship with David during hard circumstances. When he provoked the ire of his father. When he actually was willing to see his desires and, and his hopes of, of one day ruling be set aside. But none of that caused him to set aside his loyalty and his love for David. This was covenant love. Guys, I like this story and we'll be done. It comes out of the First World War of two friends, two buddies that grew up together in a small town. They were inseparable in life and we're going to see in a moment they were inseparable in death. They enlisted together, trained together, were shipped overseas. They fought side by side in the trenches of France and during one attack, one of the guys was critically wounded and he was caught in a field filled with barbed wire and there he lay groaning with his life blood streaming out of his body there was withering machine gun fire and his friend was down in the trenches saw his friend in trouble and wanted to get up and he made an effort to get up over the trench to go to his friend when the sergeant pulled him by his tunic belt down into the trenches and said son are you mad he's dying and soon enough he'll be dead and if you go out there you'll be dead along with him as soon as the sergeant turned his back, the friend was up and over the trenches. A couple of moments later, he staggered back into the trenches, mortally wounded himself, carrying his dead friend. The sergeant looked at him with anger and pity and said, What a waste. He's dead. You're dying. I told you, it wasn't worth it. To which the young dying soldier said, Oh, yes, it was, Sarge. When I got there, my friend said, I knew you'd come, Jim. I knew you'd come, Jim. Covenant friendship. Loyal friendship. 
guys, set a pattern of, of commitment to a local church. Don't come from one church to another church. Don't come from one Bible study and flip to something else. Stick things out. Work hard so that, that the relationships are real and tempered by difficulty and failure, but you work through them so that this kind of love and this kind of enrichment and this kind of timely friendship becomes part and parcel of what we're doing here at Kindred Community Church. I look forward to being part of what's going on in the men's ministry. I'm going to make that a priority and a passion of mine because I believe with all my heart, as go the men, so goes the ministry. And this church needs a body of men just like you, meeting on a regular basis, even outside the worship times, where we cheerlead each other, encourage each other to be men in a society that mocks biblical manhood that undermines biblical leadership, that tries to sissify us and feminize us and our children and our sons. But we're stamped with the image of God. There is a distinction in God's economy between men and women. There are different roles. There's a, we're, we're equal by nature but distinct in function. And God has us at a place in life that's so strategic and, and we can't afford to drop the ball. We can't afford to fumble. To use Saturday football language. God's punted the ball towards us. Don't fumble it. Grab it. And with others to your left and to your right, start to run towards the spiritual finish line. You'll be tackled. You'll be bumped. You'll be knocked. But my, with others' help that's timely and enriching and covenantal, we can get to the end zone and say with Paul and his hope for Timothy, I've I've finished the race. I've fought the fight. I've kept the faith. PG or uh, P. Wee Rees put his arm around Jackie Robinson that day and saved his baseball career and showed a Boston crowd what it meant to be a friend. May there be those kind of moments in each of, of our lives. Amen. Let's pray. And let's hang around. I know others have to, to head on, but let's just hang around. And if you're with a couple of guys, you kind of can talk to. Just talk about the message or go home and reflect on it. Get that book, Quality Friendship, by Ganner Enrig, and, and be challenged about this. Father, we thank you for our, our time together this morning. Thank you for the sumptuous breakfast, all the good things that you give us. We say with David in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul. He He satisfies my mouth with good things. But, oh God, beyond the physical provisions, we thank you for those that you have placed in our life. You understand it's not good that we would be alone. You you say in Ecclesiastes 4, two is better than one. So, Lord, help us as men to pursue real, genuine, time-consuming, life-changing, eternity-altering friendships with other men. God, help us to um, call each other to account. Help us to speak into each other's lives when the chips are down. Lord, um, we thank you for each other. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this ministry. And we just look forward to continue to build on the momentum of the retreat and our breakfast together. Lord, uh, help us indeed to find a Paul and a Barnabas and a Timothy in each of our lives. Help us to look at Jonathan and David as an example. And Lord, even beyond that, help us even to look at your son and what he did with 12 men. He poured his life for three years, not into the masses, but into 12 men who would impact the world for him. And so, Lord, just help us to afresh understand the need for and the nature of complementary Christian meal friendship. For we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.